Thanks for having us here on this, the uh, 234th anniversary of signing the Constitution. Um, you know, today we're here to really talk about access to justice and justice and what it means um, in our constitutional system. Um, I'm Joshua Goodwin. I'm the managing attorney of the Chillicothe Office of Southeastern Ohio Legal Services. Uh, I've been in practice since 2006 um, and have been working here in Chillicothe in Southeastern Ohio since 2008. Uh, and I'm joined today by my colleague, uh, Patricia. She's our pro bono coordinator. Um, and weirdly, we both went to Vanderbilt Law School, which is not often that we find any of our colleagues uh, in this part of the state. So uh, just a weird coincidence. Um, so at Southeastern Ohio Legal Services, we provide free legal advice and representation to uh, folks who are experiencing poverty um, or who are elderly uh, throughout Southeastern Ohio. And um, the topic of justice is something that's dear uh, to all of us um, at, at Legal Aid. It's probably why we do what we do. Um, so with that, we could go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, we can go ahead and kind of jump in to the Constitution itself. Um, and so to, there's really no better place to begin than the beginning. Uh, so if you want to go ahead for one more slide, uh, the Constitution begins with preamble. Um, and the preamble doesn't really, it's, it's not legal precedent, but it sets the tone for everything that the Constitution stands for and why we decided to go down this path 234 years ago. And so it's worth, worth reading in full. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity to ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. There's a lot going on in that one long sentence. A lot going on. Today, we're going to talk about the established justice portion. From the very beginning, one of the explicit goals of the framers had was to establish justice. So today, we're going to start by discussing what we mean by justice. I am not a philosopher. I'm not a constitutional historian. I'm going to give you a very rough definition of what I mean by justice as we talk about this. Uh, we'll then explore the role of the judiciary in our constitutional system, um, the importance of the 14th Amendment. It may not be as old as the Constitution, but it is impossible to talk about justice in this country without talking about the role of the 14th Amendment. We'll then talk about the state and idea of access to justice today. And then I'll pass you off to my colleague, Patricia, who's going to talk about the role each of us can play in our constitutional system in furthering that constitutional goal of establishing justice. So let's go ahead to the next slide. I'm going to spend a lot of my time talking about concepts like justice and access to justice. And I think it helps to have some kind of at least agreed upon general definition. Uh, gallons of ink, really digital, have been spilled over what is justice. Uh, has different meanings both across time and across cultures. For today's purposes, when I refer to the concept of justice, I mean a sense of cosmic fairness, essentially, uh, where power is used equitably and predictably, uh, regardless of one station of life. It's a system where preference in deciding disputes is not shown to either side based upon fear or favor. For what it's worth, I think it's a great definition. Uh, and there are philosophers, deep thinkers, people in this room, people online, um, who probably have a, could come up with a better definition than, than I give you. But I think this captures the concept well enough for this discussion. So as we go through this talk, we don't have to have a precise definition, the more just outcome for speeding on the highway. For our purposes today, I'm much more concerned about whether our government and our judicial system is just in how it treats those who interact with it. So to take it back to this concept of speeding, it's not the fine amount that matters. It's how is the person charged? How are they allowed to defend themselves? How are they treated by the system? I should note that this justice uh, concept transcends criminal law. Uh, it applies to all aspects of the judiciary. So how are folks who are seeking a divorce treated? Uh, how are folks facing eviction treated? 
Um, how's a single mother uh, suing a giant corporation over the laws of child treated? Um, we would hope and expect that the answer is that we are all being treated justly. So if we could go forward a slide, we can start talking about uh, the role of the judiciary um, in the Constitution. Uh, I doubt that anybody here today listening um, has any questions as to what the three branches of government uh, are at the federal level. Um, but they're created by the first three articles of the Constitution. It's in the shortest of these articles, Article 3, where the judiciary itself is established. Perhaps I'm a bit biased given my profession and training, um, but I believe that the core of the Constitution's commitment to establishing justice is contained within Article 3 and the judiciary. It's through Article 3 that a co-equal judiciary is established. Co-equal to what? It's co-equal to the legislative and executive powers of this country. This means that neither the legislative nor executive officials have the right or ability to direct the judiciary. And we probably take that for granted today. Every one of us grew up and learned in uh, elementary school the three branches of government and that they're co-equal. It didn't have to be that way. And I think it's hard to remember that standing here today that it did not have to be that we had a separate judiciary. As set forth in the Declaration of Independence, one of the grievances listed was that the king has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. The colonial judges of the royal courts served at the pleasure of the king. Prior to 1766, their salaries were set by the colonial legislators and paid for by local taxes. However, in 1766, the king changed that. It was granted the authority to pay their salaries directly if he chose to do so. And he exercised that authority in 1773 in Boston. If the king was able to pay the judges' salaries, and they served solely at his pleasure, the obvious concern is that the judges' rulings would only be ones that were approved of by the king. At that point in time, the outcome of disputes may depend not on the merits of the people involved, but on the pleasure of the king, which is why this was such an important idea that it was listed as one of the grievances in the Declaration of Independence. So in this light, we can see why the idea of an independent judiciary is important to the framers of the Constitution. How do we ensure that judges are not beholden to anyone but the law itself? The framers answer is in Article 3. So in Article 3 of the Constitution, Judges are nominated and appointed by the president with the advice and consent of the Senate. Once nominated and confirmed, judges serve for life at the federal judiciary during good behavior. And additionally, their salaries can never be diminished. We can see direct parallels to why this is responsive to the situation that was established by the king prior to the framing of the Constitution. Once appointed, a federal judge never needs to seek reappointment. That's incredibly important. That frees judges to act independently of those who appointed them. There's no fear by the federal judges that they are at risk of losing their job simply due to issuing a ruling that others may disapprove. This concept was tested very early on in our country uh, with Justice Samuel, Samuel, I'm sorry, Justice Chase, um, where he was not issued ruling the way that others thought. And it was questioned, should he be removed? Fortunately, we decided at the legislative level that that's not what good behavior meant. That precedent is incredibly important. Had he been removed, we may have a completely different concept of the judiciary today. It's amazing how many of those little decisions that happened in the first 10 years, 15, 20 years, benefit us today. Writing in Federalist 78, Hamilton stated the system is, quote, the best expedient which can be devised in any government to secure a steady, upright, and impartial administration of the laws. It's only with an independent judiciary that each of us can have the hope of being treated justly. While the judiciary's independence is a necessity for a just state, it is not the only requirement. What the federal judiciary can determine and rule upon is just as important as how its judges serve. Article 3 and early Supreme Court decisions like Marbury versus Madison give the judiciary the, the right to interpret the laws. 
and to, to interpret whether such laws and acts are in conflict with the federal constitution. Again, looking at this from 234 years into the future, it is easy to say, well, of course, that's how it would work. How else would it work? But again, we think that because from grade school, we're taught Marbury versus Madison set up the right of judicial review. But there were other options. It could have been left to each branch of the government to determine whether its own acts were constitutional. The courts could have been left just to decide cases between them, between individual litigants uh, or criminal cases. Uh, and it could have been, been left to the president to decide whether his own actions were constitutional or whether the actions and acts put forth by Congress were constitutional. Um, it's hard to imagine how that system works, quite honestly. Uh, the It's Fox's guardian hen houses if you do that. What president is going to say, you know, that thing I did last week, I really shouldn't have done that. Um, and we see that tension uh, at the administrative level on a regular basis. So it's the Supreme Court, through Article Three, has determined that it gets to decide who decides what's constitutional. And it's reserved that power for itself, for the most part. There are certain political questions where the Supreme Court says, you know what, this is not really a judicial issue. We're going to allow that branch of government over there to make that decision. And they give deference in certain situations to what the branch of, uh, how that individual branch of government. But this concept of judicial review is what allows and ensures that we have actual justice through those other branches of government. Thus, because we have an independent judiciary that serves as a co-equal branch, charged with determining the constitutionality of other actors, we're set up well to have a just system, at least in theory. The importance of an independent judiciary to our sense of justice can hardly be overstated. Former Chief Justice Rehnquist referred to our independent judiciary as one of the, quote, crown jewels of our system of government. We've seen over the last 150 years the importance of the judiciary in establishing and enforcing rights of individuals as those concepts of justice have changed over time. It's hard to imagine how we get to where we are today without that. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. Article three sets the stage for a just society. Other parts of the Constitution play a large role as well, though. Uh, to this end, I want to talk about the 14th Amendment. More specifically, I want to discuss the Due Process Clause and the Equal Protection Clauses and how this one section of the Constitution has had a dramatic impact on all of us. It's, there's no question that in terms of federal litigation, that right there, the 14th Amendment, is the most litigated question uh, at the federal judiciary. So the 14th Amendment provides, in part, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. While the 14th Amendment may have only been ratified after the Civil War, the concept of due process is actually much older. That concept finds its origins at Runnymede uh, in England with the signing of the Magna Carta in 1215. Chapter 39 contained the requirement that individuals could not be deprived of property or harm except by the, quote, law of the land. This concept then made its way to the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution as part of the Bill of Rights. So why is it restated here? Because it's important to remember that ours is a federal system. This means we have a national government as well as state and local governments. The national government was created and is controlled by the federal constitution. However, state governments operate independently to a large extent from the national or federal system to the federal government. They did not apply to the states. So the concept of uh, freedom of speech, everything we think of in the Bill of Rights did not apply to the states. Now, several states did adopt a constitution, including Ohio, that mirrored a number of those rights and incorporated them in their own constitutions. But those were only enforceable at the state level, not through the, the federal level. Moreover, the promise of access to the courts that's discussed in Article Three of the Constitution was not universally available at the time of the signing of the 14th Amendment. Infamously, the Supreme Court in the Dred Scott decision made it clear that African Americans had no right to access the court system and were not protected by the Constitution. 
The 14th Amendment, passed in the wake of the Civil War, was designed in part to change this concept of the states not being bound by the guarantees contained within the Bill of Rights. That's why it specifically says, nor shall states deny these things. It guaranteed birthright citizenship and all rights attended with citizenship and was a clear rebuke of the Dred Scott decision. The Reconstruction Congress also passed the nation's first civil rights law in 1866, designed to guarantee access to the courts for all, regardless of race. It's hard to think about today, because we, when we think of the Civil Rights Act, we automatically go to the 1960s. This was first done in the 1860s, though. The Reconstruction Congress also passed 42 U.S.C. 1983, which allows for the enforcement of the 14th Amendment. And it broadened the federal court's jurisdiction to hear nearly all cases arising under the Constitution. These were big changes at that time. The Reconstruction Congress's aim was clear. It was to further right to access to justice for all citizens of the country and to prevent states from denying those rights to their residents. Unfortunately, while the court, or I'm sorry, while Congress may have intended this, the Supreme Court did not see it that way. Through the slaughterhouse cases and Plessy v. Ferguson, the court greatly confined the scope of the 14th Amendment and declared that civil rights legislation was unconstitutional. Moreover, the court reinterpreted the 14th, I'm sorry, the 11th Amendment to make it nearly impossible for anyone to sue their state in federal court. Uh, this all allowed for the implementation of Jim Crow era segregation and the systematic denial of justice to African Americans throughout the South and throughout the country in, in different ways. And lastly, despite the, the language of the 14th Amendment's Privileges and Immunities Clause, Due Process Clause, and Equal Protection Clause, all specifically talking about application to the states, this did not happen overnight. It wasn't until the 1920s that the court began holding that the guarantees contained in the Bill of Rights could be applied to the states. And they didn't do it in one fell swoop. They didn't say everything in the Bill of Rights automatically applies to the states. Instead, they, in, they developed this incorporation doctrine, uh, where individual rights contained are found to apply over time. Uh, and so a case would have to be brought to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court would say, yep, that now applies to the states. Not every right contained within the Bill of Rights has been found to apply to the states even today. Um, notably, right to civil jury trial, um, any of the Third Amendment dealing with ordering of troops, and a couple of other individual provisions have still not been incorporated. I think the expectation is that they would be uh, if it came down to it, but it's not a guarantee. That began in the 1920s. Under the Warren Court, uh, in the 1950s and 60s, significant strides were made in the furtherance of justice. Brown v. Board of Education began the process of rolling back Jim Crow. Goldberg v. Kelly, a, a case that every legal aid attorney is super excited about because it was brought by legal aid attorneys, um, was incredibly important guaranteeing the right to challenge government decisions to stop public benefits. Baker v. Carr, the court made it easier for litigants to challenge a state's apportionment of legislative seats and thereby expanded who could access the court system. The clear push throughout the Warren Court era was to open the courthouse door to all who had suffered an injury. In effect, it was allow more and more folks to have access to the justice system. I can't stress enough the importance of the 14th Amendment. The few times that I have filed cases in federal court uh, seeking to help folks who are suffering um, due to government actions uh, in the public benefits arena, be it the loss of food stamps, the loss of cash benefits, uh, or the loss of Medicaid coverage uh, for large portions of the state, have all gone through 1983 42 U.S.C. 1983, and the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Without that provision, we would not have had any luck in getting those cases to move forward. We could not access an attorney who could not afford an attorney. People who had no power in our society, as the way we structure it, had the ability to have their say uh, in, in, in front of the government. So I was talking with, with my colleague about this presentation yesterday. Um, and she, she asked a hypothetical question, if you don't have one amendment, what would it be? Um, and we both quickly centered on the 14th. Through the 14th Amendment, a lot of other things come in and become possible. So uh, it's, it was a groundbreaking, it, it shifted everything. We really have a different constitutional system post-14th Amendment than we had before it. 
That's not to say the rest of the Constitution, you don't need to read it. I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm saying that with respect to our system of justice, it's hard to find a, a, a section of the Constitution more important. So where are we today? Where do we go next? Let's go ahead and move forward a slide. Since the Warren Court, and particularly since the beginning of the Roberts Court, we've seen some of these concepts moving backwards. Um, the court is imposing more and more restrictions on who has standing under Article 3 to bring a claim. But standing is one of those legal concepts that just says who is actually allowed to file a lawsuit. The Article 3 requires that there be a case, an actual case and controversy between the parties. Um, the court, um, over time, has developed a doctrine to flesh out what that actually means. Um, what you have to understand about the Constitution is it's really not all that long um, when, in the grand scheme of things, and it's not very specific on most things. This concept of due process is about as nebulous as it can get. And so the judges are left to decide what do some of these things mean. And so they build up these doctrines such as standing to help flush out what those ideas are supposed to mean. Um, and standing is one of those things that has changed over time. Who has standing to bring, the, bring a lawsuit? Um, by making it more, by tightening down who has standing, it's reduced the number of people who have the, the right type of injury or the right type of case in controversy who can bring their claim forward. It's also harder and harder to be able to bring a claim under the 14th Amendment as the court has narrowed the scope of whose rights can be vindicated. Uh, there have been some rights lodged, such as the Caperton v. Massey Cole decision that held that state court judges must recuse themselves from cases in which a major party, I'm sorry, in which a party was a major campaign contributor. That case, um, it, it came out of West Virginia um, under the Roberts Court. And one of the justices on the, the West Virginia Supreme Court had had millions of dollars uh, given to him as part of his campaign for the Supreme Court by one of the parties uh, to the lawsuit. And the Supreme Court said, you know what, you can't do that. You can have an ele you can have elected judges, but in that kind of situation where it's going to be, it's hard for anybody in the public to say, well, yeah, that, that's probably all on the up and up. Even if it truly was all on the up and up, it doesn't look like it. Um, and the Supreme Court said, no, that's not a true system of justice. We can't have that in this country. That was clearly a, a real bright spot. And there have been some others. Um, but the general direction has been to tighten down who can bring their, their claims uh, in, in federal court under the Constitution. Even under 14, uh, 42 U.S.C. 1983, um, it, it says that if you've been uh, deprived of a constitution or deprived of a right, under federal color of law, um, that you have a claim. The, that has really been narrowed as to which rights actually count as rights for 1983 purposes. But one of the biggest challenges today, in my opinion, centers around who can meaningfully access the court system. Accessing the court system can be expensive. Uh, there are filing fees and attorney's fees. In criminal cases, if you can't afford an attorney, one would be appointed for you. However, in civil cases, if you can't afford to pay the court's filing fees, they can be waived, but you do not have a right to a court-appointed attorney. Most people, if they're in court, hopefully will be there for a civil matter. Um, criminal matters, you know, everybody knows what those are. Civil matters are just about everything else in court. If you're being evicted, that's a civil matter. If you are trying to go through a divorce or get custody of a child, that's a civil matter. If you're dealing with an estate, that's a civil matter. If you are trying to do an adoption, that's a civil matter. If you're trying to sue somebody for money, that's a civil matter. If you're just trying to get your stuff back from somebody, that, those are all civil matters. There's just no right to appoint a counsel in almost all of them. Thus, while you might be able to file your civil case in court for free, you may be allowed to, to pursue your case on your own if you can't afford an attorney. And more and more people are simply unable to afford to hire an attorney. Most attorneys in Ohio are charging well over $100 an hour. A lot are over, charging over $200 an hour. This price range is simply outside of many people's ability to pay for any kind of complicated case. I should add, we also don't have a, a concept of fee shifting in this country. So with a lot of civil litigation, if you 
bring a case and you win, um, you might still be on the hook for paying your attorney's fees. Uh, you might not get those recovered as part of your lawsuit, especially in contract cases. Sometimes there are fee shifting provisions. Um, coming back to 1983, there is an absolute fee shifting provision in that particular statute. So if you're suing a government official for um, violating a constitutional right, then you can recover your attorney's fees. And that's by design, because most of the time you can't recover monetary fees in those situations. So this inability to pay is a real problem in large parts of our state, particularly rural areas like here in southeastern Ohio. The result is that many people are left to try to navigate the court system on their own on issues that are incredibly important. For example, in the domestic relations court, large numbers of people are trying to figure out a court system and child custody without the benefit of counsel. Where and how a child will be raised is an incredibly important issue. It would be one thing if the system we were asking folks to navigate was easily understandable. However, for the most part, that did not describe the system we have. But let me provide some perspective on this. In order to be a licensed attorney here in Ohio, you have to graduate from law school. That means you also had to graduate from undergraduate school, and then you have to pass the bar exam. This typically requires seven years of post high school education, and I can tell you from personal experience, it's not exactly cheap. It's also challenging. Uh, you're giving up seven years of your life after high school devoted to this one thing, um, and you hope to pass the bar. Yet, even that doesn't fully, fully prepare you to practice law. It usually takes you a few years before most attorneys actually feel comfortable and fully at home practicing law in the court system. There are complex, arcane rules and timings for things that uh, if you screw them up, you might lose your case on what are considered technicalities. Uh, understanding what counts as evidence is challenging. Um, the system that we have has developed over hundreds of years with some of its doctrines dating back to the Middle Ages. Property law, there are concepts in our property law that still date from medieval England. Um, and to top it off, no attorney is actually competent to practice in every area of law. If you ask me to go and handle a criminal case, I would the first thing I would do is call another criminal attorney and tell me what I'm supposed to do because I don't practice because I don't practice in that area, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, in each area to be quite complex and nuanced. My advice to anybody who wants to get a divorce is don't go find the generalist attorney, find somebody who knows that does a lot of divorces. If you want to file a medical malpractice claim, you need to go find somebody that specializes in that type of work. So if you want to represent someone else in court, you're required to have many years of advanced education just to be competent. But if you are poor, you have a high school education or less, you may be stuck representing yourself. Another just kind of side note, there's a saying among attorneys that the attorney who represents himself has a fool for a client. Um, if I was to get in any kind of trouble, the first thing I would do is call my friend who's an attorney and be like, hey, I need you to represent me. Because there's no way I would want to try to do that on my own. Um, trained, attempt, trained attorneys just typically don't represent themselves uh, in court in cases that matter. They go hire other attorneys. This is all relevant to the discussion we had at the beginning of this conversation about justice in our constitutional system. We can have the best run, most impressive, impartial judiciary in the world. We can have a judiciary completely free of corruption, making perfectly fair rulings on every issue. Yet, if no one can access the system because it's too Byzantine, do we truly have a just system? If the system requires people who can't understand what they're going through to use it, is that a just system? So in addition to pushing back on the limitations that courts have placed on accessing the courts through legal doctrines such as standing, abstention, uh, immunity, uh, the entire system reliance upon attorneys um, that are out of reach for many Americans is also a challenge to the promise of justice that sets forth in the Constitution preamble. Justice that many among us cannot access because they can't afford an attorney is clearly not the best system. We should be striving for better. We can go on to the next slide. Oh, apparently, go back one, I guess. Um, so why should we care about justice? Because like it or not, you're going to have to interact with the judiciary at some point in your, 
your life. Um, you want to get married? You got to go to probate court. Uh, you get a speeding ticket? We'll see you at municipal court. Have a dispute with your landlord? Municipal court. Uh, need a divorce? You want to be in common police? Court of domestic court. You want to withdraw the child? Probate. Monetary disputes? Court system. Deal with, deal with a loved one's estate? Back to the probate court. A lot of our society runs through the court system in one way or another. If you're going to have to deal with it, I think everybody should want it to be a just, fair, predictable system. And we need a system that's responsive to everybody. I think if we were to design our system from scratch today, we might have a different system. I know that the Domestic Relations Court would have a different system where we know that half the people there are representing themselves. And in speaking with judges, it's a real challenge for the judges themselves because they need that then they feel bad about throwing cases out, but their hands are somewhat tied. So today, we should take time to reflect on our founding document, not merely celebrate it. The Constitution is a blueprint for how our government and society should work. It sets forth ideas to which we should aspire. It sets out a plan for ensuring and creating a just society. We go a long ways. I don't want it to be heard as in any way suggesting that we've not come a long ways, because we certainly have. But we still have more work to do. And it's incumbent upon each of us to continue the work of the past 234 years. It's incumbent on each of us to help bring about this idea, this really nebulous idea of establishing justice. And this work isn't something that happened in the 1960s. It's not something that happened in the 1860s. It's not something that was unique to the framers. It's something that is happening today, and we should all push hard to make our system more just and fair. And so the question really is how? How can we as individuals play a role in furthering this aim of the Constitution? Well, we do in part, I think, by helping ensure that every person can have free and equal access to the justice system. That's kind of where we come in. Our role is helping folks who are in poverty access a system that is not designed with them in mind helping ensure that their rights are vindicated. And part of our mission is to actually help seek out and address those root causes of poverty. Uh, and I don't think we're going to litigate our way out of poverty, but the concepts contained in the Constitution help us move forward on that mission and ensuring that we have a truly just and equal society. So we have here in Chillicothe seven attorneys covering seven counties and paralegal. We will have about a thousand people contact our office that we'll, we will take an application on. Without volunteers, there's no possibility of coming close to meeting the needs out there. There is a real significant need. And so any volunteers that we can have would be helpful because it's helping them understand the system of justice that we have. It's helping folks navigate this system because we're not going to be able to represent everybody in court but our hope is to at least help them understand what they're about to go through and that's something that everybody who volunteers is able to help us with that. our system just wouldn't work and i just want to to really clarify that the system of justice we have in this country is wonderful we are in my opinion quite blessed that we have a well-functioning judiciary, that we have judges whose opinions may, we may disagree with, but I have never questioned the impartiality of our judges. I've never questioned, are they doing this for sinister motives? We're lucky that we have the system that we have. It's important that we maintain and understand where we came from and that we continue to push forward on that system. Because while we have a wonderful system, there are areas where I think it could be even more just. And so uh, with that, I think that would be a good time to open it up for questions, if there are any in the room. Thank you. So I, I know I have questions, but I'm 
sure um, if anyone else wanted to ask a, a question or two before I, I go with my questions. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I kind of wrote down many, many things. Um, but I guess, right, because you mentioned, right, the eviction clinic, and it seems like you guys have a lot of, um, uh, right, that, that's taking up a lot of your time. Uh, I was kind of curious about the end of the eviction moratorium, and if that's sort of. Maybe if you guys want to talk a little bit about what's kind of changed kind of before and after and, and what you're seeing kind of on the ground. Sure. So, uh, Patricia mentioned the Fairfield County Tap Clinic. We, uh, I'm there on a regular basis with that. Um, yes, the eviction moratorium was determined to be unconstitutional um, back in August, I believe it was. Um, and so, over the, the, the time period that it was in place, there were a lot of people who absolutely benefited from that and were able to stay in their home as a result. Um, and the the real challenge, one of the changes that has taken place over the last year and a half um, is that there are not a lot of places available to rent that are affordable. Um, it used to be that five years ago when one of my clients would be evicted, I was pretty confident that if I got them two or three extra weeks, they'd find a place and be able to move in, there wouldn't be a period of homelessness. Um, throughout southeastern Ohio, that's no longer the case. Um, people are looking for weeks and weeks and weeks to try to find a place. Um, and so that eviction moratorium being in place um, was really um, critical for a lot of families. Uh, especially as the unemployment system was just bombarded with a unprecedented number of applications. A lot of people who lost their jobs were going for a long period of time without getting uh, access to unemployment benefits. Um, and I should say that the, the eviction thing is really a kind of a team project in some ways uh, with community action agencies and other agencies who are providing the eviction more relief monies to kind of fill in that gap. And so they're working overtime right now just to keep people housed. Uh, so it was a real big game changer. It, it affected different parts of the state in different ways. I can tell you firsthand from Fairfield County that um, there were dozens, hundred of people maybe that, or families that were able to maintain housing um, throughout the pandemic um, to the extent we never really left it, but uh, for, for months, until they were able to get caught up or get help. And a lot of families did. <clears throat> they were able to access those dollars through community action. Um, but they, they were waiting lists of hundreds of people sometimes. Um, so it took a little bit of time to access that and get them, get them through the system. And, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. You talked about an IT program and the volunteering. What does that entail? Like, what's all involved in that? So we have a very small IT department in our organization that serves the police research program that I mentioned earlier. Um, we actually have two people uh, handling the IT portion. We have one person and fire a second one. Uh, and so that has to do with everything from anything from uh, helping keep the system organized, uh, creating accounts for the volunteers, keeping this that organized. Uh, assigning extensions to the volunteers, helping through any IT problems that the volunteers may have. Um, it happens oftentimes where the volunteer is all set up with their Office 365 account and for some reason they're not able to access it, but they have all the credentials right. Um, or they, they're having issues going into teams. As simple as that sounds, a lot of people in our organization and a lot of our volunteers, myself included, uh, are not as tech savvy and so having a volunteer who's able to help with any IT reading that you need uh, really makes a difference. Um, we will be doing so remotely, but our um, IT people are also able to do the access to the computer remotely. Um, so we'll be able to help from from it. So our IT department is basically in the form of us. Uh, so if you were to work with them, we may have opportunities for, for our volunteers to actually go work with them. And, uh, I don't know if they're level of expertise or different things that 
I won't do it to public, but really anything from, from very small things like I can see being on um, to maybe more complicated things like uh, when I came to our VPN, which, which seems to be a really big issue when um, a few months back we included, uh, we, we added the VPN to our system and, and so tons of people had access and I can do it. I would just like to add that I think that the intersection of law and technology um, and IT is really where um, a lot of the movement and the access to justice community is moving. Um, at the national level, the self-represented litigant network is really focused on uh, how do we get people access to the courtroom and to what they need through technology solutions. I don't think that lawyers are going to be replaced anytime soon. I'm not afraid of our robot overlords in that particular sense. But figuring that using technology as a way of helping folks, A, understand what to expect in court, B, help them get access to the forms that they need in order to file in court. That is a place where, um, at some point, AI is going to be as good or better than an attorney and probably more efficient. Um, my, in an ideal world, I stop touching my keyboard and I sit around and I think big thoughts about the due process clause and how we make that, you know, those kind of claims come to life. And I let the technology fill out the forms for me. Um, that can be done for our clients as well. Uh, and so if there's folks, that there are folks who are interested in looking at a broader use of technology to further the concepts of justice. Um, we would be happy to have them. I personally find that really fascinating um, and would love to talk with people who are, are interested in that. Was that responsive to your question? Yeah. Um, I mean, on the, on the subject of uh, volunteers, I was kind of curious about the applying for grants. Um, and maybe if you guys could talk a little bit about where people have had success in getting grants, uh, since I know a lot of our students work and you know, kind of, you know, sometimes they want help, but money is an issue. So. Yeah, so that typically is school specific. Um, we get volunteers whose schools have programs that offer them grants if they want to volunteer. Uh, we unfortunately don't have access to any that we can offer ourselves. Um, we do our we are developing and we just instituted um, a fellowship that we are providing from our organization um right now we're focusing on those students for those but um you know we are always working on creating more opportunities and and possibly being able to give stipends to volunteers and so um stay tuned because we you, you never know if we're if in the near future we can have the same for um for non-law students uh non -law student volunteers um like I said, we typically, the, the volunteer typically comes to us with, with a specific grant that either their school offers or they're able to find on their own. And so we're more than happy to provide support in terms of like Sometimes I have some requirements, like you have to do a certain number of hours, a certain type of work. Um, and we're always more than happy to adjust the, the internship to whatever requirements they have. So um, if, you, if you have the opportunity, um, always come to us with that. Um, and then on the flip side, if you're able to get school credit, that, that's also you know a great opportunity to 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 do stuff like help the community and also uh, get some real world experience um, while you're in school. So um, I'm kind of curious. I don't know. Like I want if you've got more questions, I like that I have a ton. Uh, I'm kind of curious because I know I have students who often work a lot of hours. Um, and encounter a lot of problems, like, you know, that aren't necessarily in the legal problem, but kind of like that whole work-life balance. But I'm kind of curious, um, are there issues that you, you see with, um, and I'm not sure how much you guys deal with kind of labor law or labor employment issues where people don't realize that, like, what's being done to them is illegal or kind of things, things that people should know about, about kind of workplace law um, especially for you know, um, get, you know, people who maybe are working part time or working going to school full time or anything like that. We do have uh, questions come in occasionally about um, either Fair Labor Standards Act, wage and hour issues. 
Um, sometimes there are, those are issues that we handle in house. A lot of times those are things that we will be like, hey, there's an entire department within the Attorney General's office devoted to wage and hour claims. Here's who you need to contact. Um, we uh, do see uh, occasionally workplace discrimination issues. Um, the way we are set up, um, if there is a possibility of an attorney getting attorney's fees in their cases, we typically refer those cases to private attorneys. So a lot of the discrimination type cases, I mean, they're contacting Patricia, being like, hey, you have a pro bono volunteer who would be, we could refer this person to, or we know kind of which attorneys are really interested in, in do good work in that area. Um, I, I want to emphasize something you said at the beginning was, I don't know if this is a legal issue or not. Um, I get, I, I like being in the courtroom. I get really centered on court things, um, but the law is a lot bigger than that. And we do a lot of things that are not what people would necessarily think of as a legal issue. So those kind of labor issues are, are one that can end up in a courtroom, but a lot of times talking with the wage and hour division is going to get you the, your, your situation resolved. Public benefits issues, dealing with job and family services, Medicaid, things along those lines, Social Security. Um, those are issues that we get involved in because they are often legal issues. Education of children, um, access to you know an IEP plan, a 504 plan, suspensions, expulsions. Um, it's amazing how quickly an attorney's involvement can smooth out problems that folks are having. Uh, and those are those are things that we think are important in part because um, making sure that our kids have access to a good education and even help they need, uh, we're hoping will help uh, put a dent in this generational uh, poverty issues we have, particularly in southeastern Ohio. Uh, do you have anything to add to that, Tracy? Yeah, Other questions? Uh, so, let's see, I have some that are like really specific here, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I guess sort of the, the other side of that is um, family law. I know a lot of students are often kind of struggling with kind of various, you know, family, family issues that sometimes come into the legal realm. Um, so, uh, are, once again, are there, um, are there uh, things that, that maybe kind of students should know relating to family law or, or legal aid, right, where, where they might be able to get access to help um, with you know, child custody or divorce or you know, various civil issues that, that relate to family law? Yeah, you know, the Ohio Supreme Court in, in recent years has really recognized um, the importance of domestic relations and family law issues um, to uh, folks who are unable to afford an attorney. And to that end, they have put together um, self-help forms um, that are standardized across the state. What you have to recognize in Ohio is that we have a very devolved, but by which I mean, instead of having a single judiciary system at the Supreme Court, um, we have 88 separate camp courts of common pleas, and then we have that do their own thing and have the ability to do their own thing. And municipal municipal courts that can do their own thing. We don't have an integrated system like some states. It's really pushed down to the county level. Um, and so it could be really hard back in, you know, before these standardized forms to figure out which forms you actually need because it, it can be left to the individual counties. So the Supreme Court recognizing that has really helped by pushing out individual standardized forms. Um, and on our website, we have kind of, we put them into packets for if you and you want to get custody, this is a set of forms. If you're an unmarried couple and you want to change your custody situation, we need these forms over here. So we have some of that on our website. Um, we also will take uh, and, and try to talk with folks. If we talk to everybody that calls us with a domestic relations issue, if we just talk to them, um, I would need another 10 people in my office just to cover Ross County, I guess. Um, and so we're really limited, uh, and internally we're taking applications and talking with folks primarily where um, 
there's uh, drugs involved or if there's been history of domestic violence or a severe monetary imbalance. So, you know, one person is making, you know, $150,000 a year, the other person was a stay-at-home parent. Um, that could be just a really unfair situation. Um, but even then, a lot of times we're helping folks get the paperwork filled out. And sometimes that's all folks need. You know, everybody's in agreement, they just gotta have the paperwork filled out so that the court can get, you know, can sign off on their paperwork. Um, I think I get jaded sometimes and forget that, you know, not everything has to be an all-out battle, um, <laughs> which is often where we, what we see. Um, so yeah, this is, I, I've been really um, uh, a cheerleader for what the Supreme Court has done um, in, in making it easier for folks to get those. I think volunteers are a little bit harder to come by to do family law outside of, uh, for full representation. But again, this is where those clinics that Patricia is talking about, um, where we have wonderful volunteers who will help explain that to the people who maybe we can't take internally. Yeah, that's, um, okay. please. So that's the, that's another thing that I wanted to mention. So if you um, have any legal issues that you think would be helpful, you should always feel free to contact our organization because even if we're not, unless we have a conflict of interest and then we unfortunately are not able to help you and we can refer you to other resources, uh, if we don't, if we're good to go on conflicts, you can always come to us. And if we're not able to help you internally, we can at least refer you to either one of our in-person clinics. Uh, or our virtual clinics, um, and the reason why I didn't I didn't include our virtual clinics here um, in terms of volunteering is because we're not really taking any um, volunteers except for lawyers right now for the virtual clinics because there's nothing um, really to do uh, besides talking to the client on the phone. So if you are the client and you're interested in getting you know advice over the phone, uh, or you are completing the forms and you don't understand some of the questions. Uh, and we're not able to help you internally, you can get set up for one of either our virtual clinics or in-person clinics, and you can come with your forms and have somebody uh, help you with, with the questions that you have. I would say we're not able to, to go over every single question with, with people, unfortunately, just because, you know, it would take lots of hours that we, our volunteers also don't have, but we are able to help complete complete the, the forms or, you know, any, any specific questions that you have or or anything that you know you know how to enter on it. Um, we also have this new project that we um, haven't got it far yet, uh, but it's called Bridging the Divide. And right now it's focused mainly on, on, on domestic issues. Um, and so if you want a little more help, you can. Um, we're not there yet, but we're getting there. Um, you could be referred to this process, to this um, system where you would meet, you would have two consultations with a volunteer attorney. Um, or this platform called, called Bridging the Divide, and you will have the opportunity to um, talk to them uh, through a video conference. You could share forms uh, with them. They can complete forms for you um, online. As Josh was mentioning earlier, this this is a great, great project where you know you just enter information and that auto populates uh, the, the forms for you, which is amazing. Um, and so we're not quite there yet for that, but we are. So we we are working towards that. So keep in mind that we do have several options. Um, and the worst that could happen is that if we are not able to offer you any help at all, we will refer you to, to other uh, resources in the community that could. So always, I would always err on the side of contacting us if you can help with your problem. Uh, and I did have one last question, which kind of relates to that. Um, I do know that you guys had um, Earlier, before I saw you guys do driverless clinics, and I know um, sort of uh, regulations are changing about like documentation needed to get a driver's license in Ohio. So um, I'm not too sure if you guys want to comment on that, but I know right, um, our students sometimes are kind of at that point where you know um, they may be encountering driver's license issues. So, so we so the, our driver's license clinic that we've had in the community are mainly focused on reinstating your driver's license. Right. So if you've had any issues where your driver's license was suspended, uh, you can come to those. Right now we don't have any specific dates planned yet, but we will. We are trying to work uh, on getting some clinics, some clinics up and running maybe next year or towards the end of the year. We don't have anything, anything concrete yet. We just have one in Fertile County uh, on August 18th. 
but if you do have general questions, um, I believe this is something that one of our volunteer returns will help you through the virtual clinic. Uh, and the virtual clinic is just a phone call. Um, you, you contact our office if you refer to one of the virtual clinics you're set up for, uh, for a day in a middle of time. Um, you just need to be available during that window. The volunteer attorney contacts you over the phone and then you can um, discuss you know, any questions that you have with them. Um, but yeah, and if you have any issues with your already have your driver's license and need it to be reinstated for whatever reason, you can also come to the clinics that we offer. Or you can also contact our office and see um, if you can be referred to either help in house or your personal attorney who can provide advice. We do that right now. So if you have issues, you don't have to wait for something to happen. You can also contact our office and uh, be referred to one of the volunteers who can help you over the phone and just provide you advice and come to the next. <laughs> well, we appreciate the opportunity to come talk today. Really do. I, I do hope folks take a little bit of time and reflect on just how fortunate we are to have the system that we have um, and look for opportunities to, to continue to work on the system um, to make it even better. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you.